name is Angie Gregg, and we are hopping on here with, with some community questions um, about COVID-19. Wesley and WSU has teamed up to um, talk about this, especially as we're easing restrictions and businesses and services are reopening. And we've got a panel here to talk about some of the questions. I just want to let you know that we have a live session on the side that you can ask questions to us. Um, we know that the community could have concerns. I mean, we're like some, we've gotten some questions before I have about, are you afraid to go to the hospital? Um, does everyone who's admitted have COVID? Who should come in? We've got Dr. Moore. Um, and I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves. My name is Angie Gregg. I'm the director of Wesley Children's Hospital. And I've been here for six years since the Children's Hospital is open. And um, we're seeing patients in and out, although our numbers have been fairly low, and Dr. Moore will be able to talk more about that later, of what we've done as a hospital system. I'll share that with you to make sure that you are safe and everything is good here for you guys to come. I'm gonna let Teresa first introduce herself. Hello, everyone. And um, I hope that everyone is safe and that one is um, taking care of each other and working together. Um, I'm Teresa Lovelady and I'm the president and CEO at Health Corps Clinic. Uh, we're located um, right off of 21st Street, about three blocks east of, um, I'm sorry, three blocks west of Wichita. Um, health Corps Clinic is a community health center and we provide access to care um, to medical for medical, dental, behavioral health, substance abuse, and pharmacy services anyone regardless of their ability to pay for services and or if they have insurance. Um, we also provide other types of services um, for the community. Um, last year we served about 10,000 patients through 35,000 encounters. Um, recently in support um, of the Wichita community in partnership with Wichita State University, we provided access to free COVID-19 testing um, at the WSU Metroplex location, and we provided access to over 1,700 individuals in our community. Um, as we do open up and reopen our community, we want to make certain that we're working together um, as a community to make certain your family's safe and that um, we prepare you, prepare you, and provide you the information and you need to. Uh, make certain that you guys remain healthy and um, and happy. Okay, Camille, how about you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. So glad to be here today. My name is Camille Childers. I'm the Director of Student Health Services at Wichita State University. Student Health Services is an on-campus clinic that serves the students of our uh, campus community. We also are the kind of a mini public health for the campus community. There's a lot of bits and pieces that go with campus, such as athletics and housing and some of our clinical rotation students and students that may have special needs. And all of that, uh, we work with the campus community to make sure that services are available for students. We help connect them to like the care team or to disability services or to having financial aid issues or access to food or homelessness issues. We have the resources to try to connect students to that. So as a nurse, I've been working with WSU for about eight years. I've been very involved as COVID has developed and affected our campus and our community. Uh, WSU has had a pandemic planning team, which I've had the honor of serving as a team lead for. And then as we went forward and started working on our Shockers United reintegration plan to um, kind of transition staff back to campus and get ready for students in the fall, I've been working with the health and safety group to identify areas where we need to look at what's our going to be our process and expectations regarding how we provide a safe environment for both faculty, staff, students, and visitors and when they come to WSU. Um, Dr. Moore, why don't you tell us about yourself? And I'm an infectious disease physician. That's yeah, honestly I, not much to say. I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I uh, born and raised in Wichita. Um, uh, did my, uh, uh, went, to, went to college at Washington, Washington University in St. Louis, came back to Wichita to do my medical school training. Um, I was in uh, Houston, Texas uh, at Baylor uh, as the, uh, entry my internal medicine residency. And then I uh, did my infectious disease fellowship at the National Institute of Health uh, with Dr. Fauci um, uh, before I came back here in 1997. 
I've been here since 1997, with the exception of a two-year stint in uh, New Orleans, where I was the chairman of infectious disease at Oxford uh, Clinic. Um, anyway, that's all there is to it. That sounds great. Okay, I have a list of questions, but I hope the community types in <laughs> questions. I think I'll just start here first. Um, with the medical portion of it, and then we'll get right into more of the questions. We have um, heard from the community, and we've seen some that people are delaying care to come into the hospital because they're afraid that if they come in, they get COVID. Although me, as um, the director of pediatrics, I feel probably safest in the hospital right now than I ever have. Um, we are making sure all of our patients are safe. We are masking. Um, visitors, the process is when you first come into the hospital, we only have four entrances open. We um, ask questions if you have a cough, fever, if you've been around anyone that you know who's COVID positive, if you've been tested COVID positive. Also, we put masks on all of our employees. Our employees are having the same questions and also are taking their temperatures daily. Um, we're restricting visitors and everyone in the hospital is wearing a level one mask. So first of all, I just want to make sure that people feel comfortable from our entrances, from the ED up to the floors, that our community feels safe and comfortable coming into the hospital. We don't want you to delay um, care because as we've started to reopen back up, we're seeing a, probably sicker cases than what we could have because I know the community has been fearful to come in. So I just want to relieve folks with that first. So I think I'll just start um, with one of the first questions, and this probably goes to Dr. Moore um, with COVID. And it's, are there over-the-counter medications that I should avoid during the pandemic because of COVID? Well, um, I'm not aware of any uh, over-the-counter medications that should be avoided. I mean, um, um, you know, just as a general rule, um, so the, the the FDA uh, has um, um, has a has a special section within within their walls uh, that monitors or uh, controls the safety uh, uh, and efficacy ensures the safety and efficacy of non prescription medications um, that are available over the counter. This does not apply to health supplements, health food supplements, or health you know healthy supplements that are that are marketed. That's just due to um, um, a very powerful uh, lobby and. Congress, uh, they, uh, uh, those those, medic those those items, um, some call them medications, but the herbal supplements are not regulated. So it's just as a general rule, I'd say you probably need to stay away from uh, things that are not uh, uh, approved uh, by the FDA um, for use. But in general, any any uh, over-the-counter um, uh, pres uh, non-prescription medication uh, is, is safe as long as it's used as um, as indicated uh, and as recommended in the, in the packaging. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Dr. Moore, do you feel like the hospital is a safe place to be at this time? It is. I have to say, I spend almost all my time there, so I hope it's safe. Um, uh, no, it's it's quite safe. Um, uh, in fact, I think it's safer now than it has been, primarily because you know the majority of people you, you can't get into the into the hospital without wearing a mask, and uh, people that come into the hospital are screened first to see if they have uh, are having symptoms that are. Uh, just that they might be ill. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's very safe. But here's here's the thing I really would like to emphasize, though, and that is, as, as Angie said, um, as you might imagine, there, there are a large number of people that are that are afraid to go to the doctor's offices, afraid to go to the hospital because they're afraid they're going to catch COVID, and this has contributed significantly to um, what has been observed by the CDC uh, and the number of excess deaths around the country, where we have people that, and we've certainly seen this locally, where people are having chest pain at home and don't want to go to the hospital because they figure it's, you know, the risk of getting COVID is worse than what they could have. And in fact, they end up um, having heart attacks um, uh, and significant complications that could have been avoided. We've also seen strokes. Uh, we've seen um, uh, certainly we've seen people with advanced disease, which did not have to happen um, um, had they come in earlier. I can't emphasize this enough. If you need to come to the emergency room, by all means, please come to the emergency room and take care of yourself. COVID. We're, we're for two reasons. Number one, first of all, uh, the hospital is a safe place to be. Uh, we're taking precautions to, to limit the spread of COVID, limit the introduction of COVID into the hospital. But more importantly, um, the, in our community right now, we're actually, um, uh, you know, thankfully, everybody has taken COVID seriously, and we're, we're uh, experiencing the relative um, 
period of calm and the number of uh, cases of COVID. I suspect that will change as things have opened up. In fact, we've already started to see some uh, cases this week uh, that were directly attributable to Memorial Day weekend activities. Um, but uh, uh, be that as it may, uh, the risk of acquiring COVID um, uh, is, 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 I think, lower now or this week than it, than it has been. Okay, I think this next question is probably for Teresa, okay? Um, because you've been doing a lot of testing out in the community. My next question is, if I wanted to be tested for COVID-19, where can I get tested? Well, uh, right now, um, as of today, uh, the, the Central County Health Department has opened up the testing for anyone, whether they have symptoms or not. So you can dial 211 and um, be directed to a place that you can go for testing, um, including the health department and several of the other health centers around um, said county and around um, around Kansas as well. Um, health Corps Clinic is still providing access to testing. Um, you can visit us at our website at um, healthcoreclinic.org and or on our social media accounts. I think it's, it's critical that if you need access to care that you seek care. I want to also kind of piggyback on what Dr. Moore said that um, along with the hospitals being a safe place, community clinics and, and your medical providers are also taking the precautions to make certain that they, the medical offices are clean and safe places that you can seek care. Um, of course, when we close down um, um, and really protect our community by um, the stay-at-home order and putting many precautions in place so that we can all figure out how to get ahead of um, as part of the pandemic, we, we all have the time to figure out how to best protect community and each other. Um, at Health Court Clinic is an example, we put up kind of shields to protect staff um, as well as um, patients when it comes to the clinic. Uh, we have screening before you come in for an appointment as well as once you enter the building and everyone's screened from employees, to patients, to visitors, um, and anyone who comes into the building is screened. And if you screen positive, um, we also have separated our entrances where we have um, I hate to say the sick entrance, but it's uh, we have a respiratory clinic set up that if the screen's positive, that we're still able to provide access to care for you in the respiratory clinic where our um, employees are um, fully protected in personal protective equipment that we can still provide access to care. And it has kind of a safe space where we can treat you appropriately and get you the care that you need. Uh, many healthcare providers have also implemented telehealth and other types of services to best provide access to care. So if you feel sick, if you're having any symptoms or you just, you, you need help, don't, don't delay getting any access to care at this point. Your health is most important to us and to your medical provider. And if we could delay and prevent, and I mean, prevention's worth, is it Dr. Moore, prevention's worth a pound of the cure? Um, if we could get you in early and get the support that you need, um, we're saving your own life. So please don't delay getting in for any care um, that you need. Um, the coronavirus did not cure cancer. It did not cure diabetes, hypertension. It did not eliminate or er eradicate any of those other diseases. So get out there and get the support that you need. Your health is that important to you and your family. Um, so when it comes back to testing, one of the things that we did find is that um, we tested, I actually brought the numbers out, uh, over during the month of May, we tested 1,724 individuals. About 2% of those individuals were positive. It was very interesting, those positive numbers, and, and the 2% was about 19 of those individuals um, were positive. I'm sorry, not 19. 19. I'm sorry, we had 19 individuals that were symptomatic that were positive, and we had 17 individuals that were asymptomatic that were positive. So these are individuals that had no symptoms whatsoever. No symptoms. They came up, they got a test, were positive, they didn't have any symptoms whatsoever. Meaning they were contagious, they were in Texas, they're in our community, no masks, walking around, going to work, so it's still in our community. And so if you're at home and you're having symptoms or you're having any kind of trouble, that you go out and seek care because the infection is, coronavirus is still in our community and it's reopened. 
um, our community and you feel like you need access to testing or you feel like you've been exposed to someone, um, make certain you dial 211 or reach out to your home profit um, healthcare provider and get a test. And if someone tells you no, call somebody else. Don't accept no as an answer. Call in until you find a place you can get a test. Yeah. Hey, that, that's great, a great point. Um, Camille, what's WSU doing to get ready now that the summer season's here? There's not so many kids on campus, but I know everyone's anticipating letting their kids. I have a college student letting my child go back to school, too, in the fall. So, And I know right. summer classes are going, but I think they're still online, right, mostly? That's correct. Yes, classes are online 100% until fall. So just kind of um, dovetail off of Teresa and Dr. Moore's comment. I, I totally agree that access to care is important and student health services on campus uh, provides both sick and wellness care for students. So we've not stopped seeing students to come in for routine medical care as well as illness care. So if you are a WSU student and you have access to student health, please come and see us. We also have a little bit of a hybrid model where you could do a telehealth appointment if you feel like, you know, even if you're not in Wichita, but you're a Wichita State student taking classes online and you want to talk to a healthcare provider, go to the My Shocker Health portal. You can submit a secure message to us and we may be able to assist you over the phone. So please don't allow COVID to interfere with your access to care or asking questions. So when it comes to WSU and coming back to college, as, you, as I said, right now, classes are 100% online. And we are planning to open up in the fall and have students back on campus, have classes open, have um, the dorms open, trying to plan appropriately to make sure that activities on campus are going to be within whatever the requirements are at that time for mass gatherings or social distancing. So we're following all of the regulations that are being put out by public health partners such as Edgar County or um, Kansas Department of Health Environment and the CDC, working with our local health departments to make sure that we're following the recommendations. So what's it gonna look like when you come back to campus, whether you're a student or a faculty member? We did a really good um, joint plan we call Shockers United. And our first phase we called pre-opening and that went to the 26th. As of May 26th, um, staff and faculty have started coming back to class in sort of a staggered fashion. Um, we did encourage uh, those that can to still do some remote work. Um, and, you know, the university never really closed. We just went to an online and remote format, except for essential staff. So we are has asking departments to be available on campus to, for students or visitors to come in if they need to ask questions, they need to provide services for um, whatever it is, whether you want to talk to somebody about advising or whether you want to come in and talk to somebody about your financial aid. There are hours that the these departments are open and all of that is listed on our website. Um, most of them are open from nine to one and there's staggered staff coming in to cover those hours. Then over the next few weeks through the um, end of July, we are gonna be working up to getting more people back on campus and trying to do more of a full opening. That's what we call our second phase of our Shock United plan. And then we're moving into the fall semester phase, which will start in August. And by that time, summer classes will be finishing up online and we'll be preparing, preparing to move into more of a hybrid um, online, if needed, phase, but still having in, in-person classes. We've always had some classes that have been online and those will continue, but most of the classes, we're gonna be um, an in-person classroom, but we're calling it a hybrid format. And th what that means is, if something occurred where we would have to go online, the faculty and instructors are prepared to do that. But the plan is that the university will be open and classes will be in, in person, in classroom. Those that have always been will continue to do that. So we have looked at what are our health and safety requirements for coming back to class. And we get a lot of questions about this. We are kind of, we are asking faculty, staff, students and visitors are expected to wear face covering. Um, and then when they're walking outside by themselves or maybe in their office or their dorm room alone, you do need that. But if you can't maintain social distancing or you're going to be in a group or you're going into our buildings, we do ask that you will have a face covering primarily because we can't always guarantee that you're going to be six feet from somebody in more of our public spaces. 
And we're also um, are looking at what we would do in regards to um, athletics. I know that there's a uh, the conference is meeting and talking about what that would look like for how we get back to soccer, basketball, and baseball, and volleyball, and all of our wonderful sports. So we want to make sure that we're doing those appropriately and providing safety measures for our student athletes. Thank you. That's great. Okay, I have a live question now. I have a couple of live questions. This one is from Polly B. And she says, thank you. If you are 65 or older, how much precaution should you be taking at this point? Can you see your grandchildren? And can our household members go out more? It's probably for Dr. Moore. It, but it could be for everyone, but... Well, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so I would say really, um, if you're 65 years of age or older, uh, you are uh, more at risk of developing severe disease with this infection. Now, having said that, so is a 30-year-old asthmatic or a 40-year-old diabetic. So uh, I'm of the opinion that um, whether you're 65 years of age or older, you should be exhibiting the same um, concern and, and precaution about this virus as um uh, that is, if you're younger than 65, you should be exhibiting this uh, concern and precaution about this uh, this virus that, that those who are at risk for for invasive or, or severe disease are. Um, uh, there's a trifecta that I think uh, we all need to follow, and I, when I say all, I mean at least 80 percent of the studies clearly show that at least 80 percent of the population has to follow uh, for this this to work. But if 80% of the population, that is a minimum of 80% of the population wears a mask, it doesn't have to be a surgical mask, it's a mask cover, a, a mask that covers your, your mouth and your nose. Um, if we use hand sanitizer um, uh, and if we decontaminate public spaces um, by wiping them down, that trifecta will go a long way to minimizing um, any um, uh, transmission of the virus. Um, you know, in Japan, for example, has a very large country, a very, very, very high number of people, very dense population. Um, I'm not making sense. What I'm trying to say is that the, the population of Japan is quite large and they're densely packed together in certain parts of the country. And yet, despite that, they have a very low rate of infection and, and similarly a very low rate of, of uh, disease, uh, severe disease and death. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, they, that the majority of the population, 80 uh, percent, wears masks. Uh, has worn masks during this pandemic. And um, they've also been assiduous in their application of hand sanitizer and wiping down public services. And so I really think everybody needs to uh, pay attention to that and to do that. I'm not talking about wearing masks in private. Obviously, I'm not wearing one now because I'm in the privacy of my own office. Only the parasites have to worry. But at, at any rate, they, I think everybody just has to just take this seriously. Um, can you see grandchildren? Uh, yes, you can definitely see grandchildren, yeah. but um, there, the, the, this is this is a difficulty. You know, anytime, uh, so Cedric County, the Cedric County Health Public Health Department made the recommendation that people should continue to socially distance, um, but they also made um, the decision to not have it uh, be enforced. Um, so, um, uh, in theory, everybody, I mean, so, so technically speaking, everybody could ignore those guidelines and do as they please. We're, we're as, as the public health professionals, um, we're still recommending that people take precautions, wear the masks, use the hand sanitizer. It becomes difficult when, you know, obviously people have been cooped up and they want to see their family members that they haven't seen in a while. Um, I certainly um, think that's reasonable, but I just, it's a matter of limiting your uh, exposure. Um, uh, uh, you know, kids, kids can have sleepovers, but that's probably not the best idea. Um, and certainly not the best idea to have a sleepover with uh, at one house and the next week in the next house and, and so on. It's, it, we still have to be cautious in our, uh, in our uh, exposure to others. Okay, my, I have two more questions and they relate to kids. Um, the first one I'm gonna go ahead and answer and it's have we seen very many kids in the hospital? And actually we've seen a very low amount of children that have come in. Um, we have some that, um, patients of interest, we call them PUIs, and most of those have tested negative. So, but Dr. Moore, this is one with the new multi-system disease that's representing, looking more like Kawasaki's. How do you feel about that disease? What well, you know, we're, we're learning a lot more about the virus. Um, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an awful thing to say when I say what an exciting time it is to be an infectious disease specialist. Um, because uh, we're, you know, this, this is one of the reasons I went into infectious diseases because it's, it's always changing. There's always something new. This is not quite the new thing that I wanted to see. But nevertheless, it's here. 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, this virus um, started out exhibiting one set of symptoms and it over time as, as literally hundreds of millions of people have been infected, the virus has undergone some changes, some uh, mutations. So we're starting, and the more people that are infected, the more you start to see unusual manifestations. This is one of them, uh, the Kawasaki-like syndrome, which by the way is now not just seen in children, but it's been starting to be reported in, in younger adults as well. Um, uh, furthermore, um, it, 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 the virus has uh, also begun to demonstrate evidence. Um, they've been tracking this, this virus over time and they're starting to, it's starting to show genetic mutations. Some are um, um, uh, loss of function mutation. By that, I mean, uh, it, it, in some, some strains, they, they, it's becoming less infectious or less um, pathogenic. Um, in, other, in other situations, it's becoming more pathogenic and more virulent um, and presenting in different ways. So um, what we know about the virus and its manifestations now uh, will largely, I, I, I expect will, that will largely go unchanged, but the body of evidence uh, surrounding that will uh, will grow as more people are infected and as the virus mutates. I can't tell you what's going to happen in a month. I mean, you know, we, we didn't know that this syndrome even existed eight weeks ago, and yet here it is. Um, right. uh, what, is something else going to pop up? Who knows? Um, no, but actually, uh, I'm going to caution my, my, my statements or, you know, issue a caveat, if I may, that uh, I am a board certified internist. I'm not a pediatrician, but I am I am somewhat immature, so that should probably count for something. <laughs> right. Okay. I've got the next question. Uh, thanks for answering that, Dr. Moore. My next question is um, about minorities. Why does it seem like it's affecting minorities, or how is it affecting minorities? And is it worse, more, or what are you seeing, Teresa, from from your aspect? Well, I know uh, I'll go back to our testing that we, um, okay. I'll, I'll call it a random test here in Wichita. Um, the total number that was infected was 36. Um, of those 36 individuals that were, um, that were positive out of the 1,700 individuals that we tested, 16 of those individuals were Hispanic, nine were African-American, and nine were white. And we had two that were native Hawaiian or, or other Pacific Islanders. What was very interesting initially, we had um, um, kind of a, a, a large African American um, disparity, and then um, we had a couple of families that had traveled back from Mexico that the entire households were positive. We know nationally uh, that there are huge disparities with um, the coronavirus um, infecting and infection rates and death rates in communities of color, specifically African Americans. And now it's shifting to um, um, Hispanic communities. We know that this is directly linked to social determinants of, um, and huge health disparities that have been existing for a while. Um, I know with the community health centers across across Kansas and across the United States, you know, we're we're working to help address some of those social um, determinants of health and, and help provide access to services and education and information. Uh, some of the information that we did collect while we were providing the testing is asking uh, individuals who came up for testing. Um, Kind of why they wanted to get tested and what were some of their greatest fears, and we know that there was a lot of misinformation um, in uh, some of our communities of color about the virus, um, and it was part of our goal to make certain we were providing appropriate education and information as well. I mean, it was some simple things like uh, initially there was information where it, you know, black people could be infected with um, kind of that was misinformation that was out there. Um, but really helping people understand. And then you had to fear with the testing that, you know, what the testing would look like and they were going to get all the way up to the brain. And, you know, so sometimes really um, helping to educate and provide appropriate information to uh, community of color so that they feel empowered and informed and to really um, be empowered and take action on the data. Uh, we know that we can't eliminate, you know, years and years and years of social disparities and, and um, that's impacted our permanence of health. But 
what we can do right now is do our best to address the issues we have at hand um, and make certain that we each feel empowered to, to gain access to the healthcare system. Um, and I always say, if one tells you no, that person tells you don't go somewhere else because your health is that important to you and your family. Um, I don't know, Dr. Moore, if you want to talk a little bit more about the medical side of it. Well, I, I just wanted to emphasize that, uh, uh, you know, well, the this virus, this pandemic, has exposed the tremendous social inequities in, in our healthcare system. They're, they, they're, and this is, this is an open secret. This is something that physicians like myself, I mean, you know, if you take a poll of, um, of uh, people involved in infectious disease or pediatrics or um, other primary care, uh, primary care uh, specialties, uh, most people are, uh, um, uh, you know, have very liberal ideas about where the healthcare system should be, primarily because we see the, the dramatic inequities. And this, this, this pandemic, I think, is, has shown, a, uh, put a glaring spotlight on some of the, Tremendous uh, social inequities this uh, country has been experiencing in healthcare, access to healthcare, affordability of healthcare. I will stop there, but uh, I, I, it's, it's. Uh, I think it's something that's going to affect our healthcare system positively. Um, although we have to get through this, but positively for decades to come. Um, uh, I, am, I will say this though. I, I'm, I'm also very proud of our of our county, uh, in that um, uh, when testing became available to Cedric County. Uh, they deployed it in areas uh, uh, where there are significant economic and social disparity or disparities in, in, in social in, in healthcare access. So you know they didn't. As this is not true for all cities, a lot a lot of cities uh, concentrated the uh, testing um, in areas that were affluent, uh, which was um, uh, not where it's needed. It's needed where people are, are where the disease is spreading. Now, to be fair, a lot of the communities uh, did the testing where people uh, were coming back from traveling overseas, and that's that, that's linked to affluence. But uh, uh, now that the virus is here, we got to concentrate in people uh, in communities and neighborhoods where people are, are living cl in close proximity to each other um, and where the access to health care is, is quite poor. Um, anyway, having said that, I think Central County has done an excellent job of that so far. Um, and we'll see we'll see how it goes. One of the reasons, and Teresa, you mentioned this, uh, the, 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 we're starting to see um, the virus spread in, in, uh, in Hispanic communities. This may be a reflection of the tremendous spread that's going on in Latin America currently. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, especially, that's another story, but uh, certainly Mexico is having a significant problem with it. Um, and all throughout Latin America, it's, uh, it's spreading. Um, and we're starting to see some of that reflected here. Yes. And, and the other thing I also want to add, it, I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword. We know that um, there's been many injustices and inequities around um, communities of color for many, many years. but we also have to empower, um, we, we also have to step up. And I see, you know, like with one thing I always tell my kids and my my relatives is that you can always be part of the solution as well. You know, empower yourself, step up, say something. You know, they'll accept anything less than what you think you deserve as well. Um, I can tell you that my son was infected with my 25 year old that was working at um, FedEx at this time. And one of the things we did was just, you know, use it as a platform so that we, you know, it's, it, he had no problem, you know, talking to his friends and just saying, hey, it could happen to anyone. Make certain you get tested, make certain you put your mask on, make certain you practice social distancing. And, you know, don't try to throw side parties or hang out and do, you know, all the things that they call them coronavirus parties. Right, you know, <laughs> so make certain that um, we empower um, empower ourselves also to be part of the solution. So, um, and I know with uh, working with Santa County and the other community health centers, you know, there are places in every community where you can go in and get help and support, but really be part of that solution and go out. And when someone tells you, no, I mean, that's that one someone that told you no. You know, go ask, go talk to someone else. Um, and, and don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, the, this, this is what I think my right is in this situation. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process because it didn't happen overnight. Um, but I always say your health is that important to you and your family. So own your health, own your, your situation, and do our best to make a change. And let's stand together as a community and 
the valleys we grow. And, and unfortunately, coronavirus has attacked our communities and world in a way that allows us the opportunity to use this as a catalyst to change and grow and improve and work. There you go. Well, on the there other goes flip side, yeah, this is probably for Camille. You know, college students feel like they're invincible. And so how do you um, talk to a college student that they shouldn't be like at the Lake of the Ozarks at a party or big groups of parties? I don't know, Camille, do you have any advice for us parents who have college students? I think like education. I don't know, curfews. <laughs> uh, we get to ask that a lot. I mean, we have that conversation almost daily in our working groups is, you know, how do we get buy-in from the students on this plan? Education is really important. I think reaching out to them and trying to relate to them on their level is something that a lot of our programs on campus try to do. You know, whether it's doing short little videos about why it's important to me to wear a mask and why is it important to me, whether it's to protect my grandmother or it's to protect the people in my household or the people in my, um, in my neighborhood. I wanna make sure that I'm doing the right thing for my community. So there has to be some buy-in there on a personal level, some personal responsibility for making sure that you're doing the right thing. You know, one of the things that we're asking uh, employees and students to do when they come back to campus is, before you come to campus that day, we want you to consider doing what we call a personal wellness check. We have an example of a, of a checklist that we go through and, you know, do you feel like you're having a fever today? Or do you feel like you have symptoms? Or do you feel like you're safe to be around others? And that kind of goes into, do I need to wear a mask when I'm coming to campus? That's part of a personal responsibility. And you know, wearing a face covering is, is a way that you can show support, not only for your community, but also for those around us. Uh, you know, as Teresa said, this is not a one person job. This is a community effort to make sure that we're lowering the number of cases in Wichita and in the state of Kansas so that we can all stay healthy. There are people that have um, immune compromised conditions or other comorbidities that they're doing the best they can to try to fight off the risk of this exposure to COVID-19. We can all help with that. This is something that we need to do as a group. So when you're working with college students, it's great to appeal to them on the sense of a community level. They respond to that well, most of them, and you wanna make sure to understand why you're doing it, reach them where they're at. Social media is a great platform to get out and really do some short little videos. They respond to that as well. Be honest with them. I mean, most college students are wanting to be their responsible young adults and they wanna help. That's right. Okay, I've got a couple more live questions and this is from Melody. So she says, so Dr. Moore, are you saying if you want to visit with family members and grandchildren outside of the home, is it still best to wear a face mask, no hugging and keep a six foot distance during the visit? Because I know we have all of our elderly in our nursing homes too that haven't left yet either, so. Well, you know, this is a tricky uh, question to answer, um, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, until there's an effective vaccine widely uh, available, um, uh, this is going to be the way it's going to uh, way it'll be. Um, I can't tell people how to live their lives. I can only make general recommendations, and general recommendation is try to be as safe as you can. Um, you want to hug your two-year-old uh, grandchild? I'm not going to say I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to say you're a bad person for wanting to do that. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we need human contact um, and uh, family and friends are extremely important, especially in trying times like these. Um, so, you know, it's all about it's all about risk. I mean, look, if you're um, uh, if you're worried about getting the virus and, and more specifically, if you're at risk for developing severe disease from the virus, maybe you shouldn't visit or maybe you can visit by by virtual uh, 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 virtual visits, uh, maybe wear a mask. Um, you know, how are you going to tell your kid, your grandkids not to hug grandma and grandpa? I mean, that's, that's very difficult to do. Um, um, I don't have an answer other than just, you know, yeah. be safe. I think Cheryl has a question. I don't know if you, if any of you guys have read this from the New York Times today, had an, um, an article about safely hugging. Mm -hmm. um, have any of you read that article about the safely hugging? Mm -hmm. I haven't. It's from the New York Times. It sounds intriguing, but uh, no. It's safe to hug, is it safe to hug others um, outside of your household members? 
Well, you know, I mean, the virus is uh, very contagious. There was a, uh, uh, you know, we talked about the virus. Uh, in fact, I, this is probably a good time to talk about this. The, the um, yeah, we talked about the virus uh, large and mostly being transmitted through respiratory droplets. But it is important to also remember that it is certainly uh, transmitted by by contact. Um, there was an interesting article, uh, uh, an outbreak that, was, uh, that occurred in Durban, South Africa, where um, one one patient had the virus, came in with respiratory symptoms, and he was in in the waiting room uh, with somebody who who came in later um, uh, with a stroke. Uh, that person, that person who came in with the stroke, was uh, evaluated in the same room um, before they had had a chance to to isolate or identify and isolate the person they thought might have COVID. Eight weeks later, um, I forgot the numbers, but eight weeks later, uh, they had uh, um, a third of the of the hospital patients uh, had died of the virus, um, uh, and uh, the majority had had been infected. Um, and, the, the, and it wasn't from patient to patient transmission. It was it was the health healthcare staff who inadvertently, obviously, uh, uh, transmitted the virus to, from patient to patient by contact. Um, uh, and so, I, I point that out not because I'm saying hospitals are unsafe, because this was this was early in the epidemic, and this was a this was a. Uh, um, a study that was done after the fact, but the point I'm trying to make is that is that we we certainly respiratory precaution or respiratory droplets are the main mode of transmission, but it is not the only mode of transmission, and certainly contact uh, from person to person can do it as well. well. Let me I'll just say this about about the about I wanted to get this in about the infectivity about testing and infectivity. So data from uh, from Germany and from uh, some very well controlled studies uh, early on in the in the, in the uh, pandemic and that have been verified by additional studies show that um, uh, the vast majority of people are not infectious while they're while the virus is incubating in their system. It's only really for a period of up to 24 hours prior to the onset of symptoms uh, that you that you become infectious. More to the point, from the day that you develop the symptoms. To you know, ninety-five percent of people uh, will become non-infectious by day seven of symptoms, and hundred percent are non-infectious by day ten. Um, even though you can identify the virus by PCR by by molecular tests, you can find pieces of the virus for literally weeks after you've recovered. Those virus particles are literally that they're virus particles. They are non-infectious. These tests, these studies were done looking at viral cultures. So if you're able to shed uh, viable virus, live virus, um, uh, that, meant, that means you're infectious. And the, people were only able to do that, or only the live virus is only isolated um, uh, as, as far out as 10 days. After that, nobody, it was essentially zero that you could transmit the virus. Um, that's, that's an important thing I, I think people need to understand because we, there's been this, all this emphasis on, well, did you test negative? You gotta have two negative tests. Those are uh, uh, those recommendations are, are changing uh, significantly in light of these, these new data, um, and I say these new data because data is actually plural data, yeah. singular anyway. It's a pet peeve of mine anyway. All um, uh, the, one last thing I'll say about antibody tests. Right now, antibody tests are no better than flipping a coin. They're terrible. Um, uh, the FDA granted an emergency use authorization to a wide variety of antibody tests because we had nothing else available and we were, in, we were trying to identify, trace, and, and track people who were positive. Now that there are better tests that are coming out, now that we have a better handle, and now, now that things have settled down uh, uh, nationwide, uh, the FDA has revoked those emergency use authorizations uh, for those for tests which are honestly awful. Um, Sweden, the Netherlands, Denmark, they, they bought a bunch of these uh, tests early on. Um, uh, most of them came from China. Uh, those countries all quit quit using those tests and sent the unused kits back for refunds because uh, they, the tests were honestly no better than flipping the coin. So when people ask me, well, should I get the antibody test to see if I have the infection? I would say yes, if the antibody test is good. If it's not good, and frankly, the, the currently available commercial test kits are not. I mean, uh, that I, I'd, I'd say don't waste your money. Um, the, if, if the test is negative, then maybe you have never been infected. But if they're positive, the trouble is the test, the, the positive tests, sorry, the currently available tests don't distinguish reliably between the COVID-19 and the seasonal coronaviruses, which go around every every fall. So it's, I, I, I uh, you know, 
ask me in a month, I'll give you a different answer, hopefully when the tests are better tests are available. Uh, hey, I have a really good question, and I know lots of people worry about this or wonder about this. Should frontline workers, like at the grocery stores or health, wherever, should they be wearing gloves? Like, I know I see a lot of people going into the grocery stores, they have gloves on, but should people on the front lines, I'm not talking healthcare like us, because we do use appropriate PPE, I mean, protective gear when we right. go in, but should other areas wear gloves? Well, you know, you can't, there, I would say yes and no. Um, and uh, I feel like I've been giving a lot of these answers these days to all my patients, yes and no. It's, I, it's not exactly the, it doesn't inspire confidence in your healthcare provider and they can't give you a straight answer. But the, the issue, issue is this, look, as long as you're wearing a mask, that is the, by far the most effective thing you can do. Wearing, a glo wearing gloves, it can provide you with a false sense of security uh, because you're not likely to use hand sanitizer on your gloves, but you should, just like you have you do, you do with your hands. So um, I would say, should you use gloves? Eh, it doesn't really matter whether you use gloves or not to use gloves, as long as you use hand sanitizer. That's the main thing. Yeah, because I know I know um, we have some questions about, is it safe now to go back to the beauty shop? Is it safe to take your kids to daycare? As things start opening up, that was where the, I think one of the questions came from. You know, your frontline workers, should they be wearing gloves? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, that, that, those are those are other issues that are going to be difficult to answer. I mean, I, you know, what, uh, we, I, um, so so the various physicians in our community, pulmonologists, infectious disease, primary care, we all meet on a weekly basis by uh, Zoom, not a product endorsement, but by you know video conferencing um, with uh, the Central County Health Department and the Medical Society to discuss issues uh, like you know. What, what, you know, we had a, long, a lot of discussion prior to the Central County Commission meeting about what, when was the right time to to, uh, to uh, open up. And to be perfectly honest, you know, uh, our county commission made it difficult, and I think uh, they, they demonstrated real leadership in, in uh, instituting the uh, stay-at-home uh, order uh, early on in the process. And they did it right just as the virus was showing up in our community. Um, um, you know. We and we, we were able to save the patients we were able to save, and and uh, some we couldn't save, obviously, but uh, we, we we weren't overrun uh, like New York City was. Um, we had an, enough, you know, uh, PPE. Uh, we had enough uh, uh, ventilators. We had enough uh, staff to, to monitor the ventilators. Um, I think I think right, and certainly right now we we're in the same situation. Will that continue? I don't know. So the answer to the, the, the question, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but the, the answer to the question about should should we put kids back in daycare and you know should we open everything up? You know, um, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I will say that I'll go back to this point that if 80% or more of the population wears masks, we could open up everything and just like we're, where we were before. Okay, hey, so this one's probably for Teresa, this question, maybe. Sedgwick County and Health Corps have been offering testing for asymptomatic um, patients. Should everyone be getting these? Well, I I would go back and say that if you feel like you've been if if you feel like you've been exposed or if you feel like you need a test, go get tested. Um, and that's why we wanted to provide tests for individuals, whether they had symptoms or not. And now that Sedgwick County is providing testing for anyone, regardless if they have symptoms or not, um, you, you know what your um, risk of exposure is. If you feel like you need to test, then, you know, call 211, talk to your local, uh, your primary care provider and gain an access to the test. The, the concern is you know, some people are asymptomatic. You may never have symptoms. But if you feel like you're exposing others to um, COVID-19, and if having a test is going to help make certain you put your mask on or um, help you answer some personal questions about your own health care, um, then, then get a test. Um, the, and what we did in coordination with the health department, and I must also say thanks to Quest Diagnostics for uh, providing uh, enough testing kits to the Wichita community so that we could provide access to anyone regardless of their to pay if they or didn't have uh, health insurance. Um, we were able to do this. There is enough testing kits now um, for the most part for people to get tested if they feel like they need a test. So, I've got a question um, just about pediatrics and asthma. So I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, 
because now it's asthma season right now. So we're seeing more asthma than, than that we have currently. So um, they wanted to know, my kid has asthma. Are there precautions I should take beyond, beyond face washing? I mean, behind hand washing, face coverings, and social distancing. So on our asthma kids, we're given the same um, kind of directions. You know, good hand washing is the best. Probably since they have some comorbidities, if they'll wear a mask, we encourage them to wear masks. So when they're out. So anything else you would say about that, Dr. Moore? No, I think he covered it. I mean, asthma, asthma yeah. we'll see what, we'll see what happens with asthma season. You know, the, the, right. the adults that we've lost have been um, asthmatic and or diabetics. Right. So we're I'm right. nervous about it, but you know, we'll see. Okay. So we've got a big holiday coming. This is another question, July 4th. So how do you all feel about having gatherings of families and not like going to a big fireworks celebration with a large group? How do you guys all feel about the family gatherings on the 4th of July? That's another are question. Wearing, are they wearing masks? I sound like a broken <laughs> record. I'm going to sound like a broken record. But. Are they trying to social no, distance it. from people they don't know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that was one of the bad, big questions. Okay, so here's another one. Um, can you get COVID-19 in the swimming pool? Because some of the swimming pools are starting to open up too. And kids and families and at the lake. I know the lake doesn't have chlorine, but how do you feel about getting um, COVID-19 in the swimming pool? Uh, you know, the risk is low unless you're down at the shallow end having a, uh, you know, talking closely with your friends. You know, I mean, the pool, the pool water is pretty safe. Um, but it's the standing in the shallow end and catching up uh, with your friends that's the, the problem. I'm not going to tell people not to go to the pool. The pool's great. I mean, it's summertime. My goodness, have a great time. You know, pool off. But uh, just you know, use some common sense. Yeah, I think I think the main thing is now things are all starting to open up from going to get your hair cut to church to football practice is going to start shortly. Baseball practice. Um, so how do you feel about sports? I mean, if those kids are close contact, yeah. you know. I honestly don't know how that's going to work. You're going to wear a mask. Probably. Well, you can't be wearing a mask if you're doing a 40 yard sprint, or 100 yard sprint. You know, I mean, you yeah. just slow you down a little bit. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, this is a. Uh, I, I, I'd like to find out what Neil is uh, hearing from the uh, athletic director, because um, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, Camille. What do you think? I know that some of those conversations are happening um, at a conference level, and obviously NCAA is having those conversations as well. Some of the little bits I've heard so far is they're talking about how they can practice safely while social distancing. Yes, you're right, Dr. Moore, obviously wearing a mask while you're trying to do sprints and stuff, it's just not going to work. So they need to look at what is the ability for them to maybe stagger the access to the space so that people can be smart, uh, spread apart. Um, one thing that we need to be cautious of, especially students that are athletes that have not practiced recently, is you just can't come back and go 100% the first day back. You really need to make sure your students are reconditioning, especially if they've been at a stay home and, and for several months and they've not been exercising, to make sure that they're not injuring themselves by coming back and just trying to work really hard. So. I'm hoping that even in club sports and things that they realize that these students have not been outside playing as much and that they can get them kind of started slowly back into the athletic portion of their lives and really kind of do the social distancing. We've also looked a little bit at how we would space out um, stadiums and that may be something your club sports and intramural sports need to consider is when you're going to be a spectator at some of these activities, how would you space your people on the stadiums and are you going to require mass for spectators? Um, what are you going to do with your concession stands? And all of that, you need to really look at a big picture of these events and not just focus on how do I keep one population safe, but how do you keep everybody safe? There's not one answer. Every situation is going to be different. What you do for a volleyball game versus a basketball game at Coke Arena or what you do for Little League is going to be totally different. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, we're getting really close to the end of the time, and I want to give everyone just a chance just to wrap up your thoughts. So, and I'll go at the end. I have a couple more things to say, but Teresa, how about you? Anything else that is a burning platform for you that you want to talk about? Well, I have a visual. 
This template. <laughs> hey, love it. There you go. It's not the most fashionable thing. There you go. I've got a visible too. There you go. There we go. This, it's the best thing we can do right now. It's just to protect each other, to protect ourselves, protect the people we love, protect our community. Um, I know we want to get back out there and we want to, you know, get back to the new normal, whatever that's going to look like. Um, again, we don't quite know what the future is going to hold. The virus is evolving. We're trying our best to stay ahead of it. Um, we know that, you know, we, we got to do something. We don't want to break down our economy. We, we, we have so many things going on. We want to hug our grandkids. We want to, you know, kiss our grandparents. We want to love on each other. We want to visit our friends. You know, we want to travel. We want to just be normal. Again. And the best way, best thing we can do right now until we figure it out is just put your mask on. It's so disappointing when I go to the store now. And in the beginning, everyone had their mask on. And now I go and it's fewer and fewer people that are taking the social distancing circle seriously and taking putting the mask on seriously. So I keep mine in my sun visor. And when I get out the car, it's like I just drop it down, put it on, and I go in. That's yeah. simple. When you go in a restaurant, I know you can't really keep the mask on. Take it in. It's okay. It's, it's okay. Put your mask on. And um, being a minority person, in our community, we know that as it exp as we open and everything expands, it's probably going to hit the minority community hardest. You know, the black and brown community. So it's even more important that we practice social distancing and you put your mask on and you make certain that you're protecting yourself and that you figure out new ways on how to hug and what's up and you know, you know, do, do what you normally do and barbecue and you know, and, and whatever it is that that you want to do to make your summer the best summer possible. But make certain that you protect each other and, and let's do it for each other. We can do it. How about, I believe. How about you, Camille? That's great. That's great advice. How about you, Camille? I, I agree with that. And I think um, I like the term that we need to learn to coexist with the virus. Mm -hmm. COVID isn't gone. It isn't going to be gone for a long time. So we need to find a way to coexist safely with this virus. Whether, you know, and it's understanding that we are all responsible for each other and that we need to do the things that maybe feel uncomfortable. Yeah, it's not always comfortable to wear a mask, but when I put mine on, when I go to the grocery store, when I'm out shopping, when I'm doing things, I know that I'm doing this to help my community stay safe. It's maybe it's not about me. Maybe I'm a low risk group. However, the people next to me, my neighbors, maybe they're not. And I need to understand that public health is public. So we need to make sure that we're we're protecting each other. Okay, Dr. Moore. Amen to all that. I got nothing to add. These ladies nailed it. That's good. I, I think it's a great time. Sorry. I was gonna say I think it's a great time to learn to be creative. This is, you know, yes, I want to go visit my friends, but how can we do that and stay safe? So this is a great time to come up with new ideas and be creative and how we can coexist with this virus. That is for true. Um, I just wanted to, out here at Wesley Medical Center, um, we are doing COVID testing on all elective surgeries right now. So I think that that's a great help here too. And as so far, so good. We've had no transmissions within the hospital amongst staff. So that's a good sign too. But I just want to give um, a shout out to Colton, who's behind the scenes, who's been doing this broadcast. And also to Scott Evans, he, he didn't want me to shout him out, but he helped a lot So with all of this and the questions. But on a closing note, I just want to let you know that there is a Wesley website to talk about all things COVID, and it's wesleymc.com backslash COVID-19, or there's also a um, COVID hotline, and that number is 833-582-1974. 833-582-1974. So thank you all so much for being here on this website. Yeah, Dr. Mm -hmm. Moore, you want to say one thing? Sorry, I, just, well, I just noticed one question popped up on the thing and they were asking about how to protest, oh, yeah. uh, peacefully protest uh, oh. without spreading the virus. Um, uh, in the way, I'll read it, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, which tons of Americans have protested and rallied, what are suggestions for safely, peacefully protesting without spreading this virus? I know we don't have a whole lot of time left. All we'll say is wear a mask. I mean, you've heard it, you've heard it all, all, all hour. 
Wear a mask. By all means, please exercise your right to assembly and freedom of speech, but do so with a mask. And, uh, and I'll say, and please do it safely, nonviolently, and yeah. respectfully. Respectfully. Right. Yes. Amen. Thank you all. Thank I think you. that's the end. Thank you guys. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.